Chapter Four, Part One of The Spring of Joy by Mary Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Beauty, Part One The Beauty of Form. Who was he whose pencil drew the whole round of the sun? Virgil. Man can never hope to touch, in things of his making, the perfection of the forms of nature. His most magnificent architecture is dwarfed by the structure of natural things. The purest classic curve, so satisfying because so gentle, so quickening to the imagination because it leads the mind on to wish for the completion of the circle, seems small beside the curve of the horizon. The height and poetry of clustered columns dwindle beside the thousand pillars of the forest. It is not only the immensity of nature that makes the difference. It is something deeper. It is the contrast between creative genius and mere constructive art. Man makes things piece by piece, shaping them from outside, but natural forms come from within. There is no mosaic work. The creation grows up perfect in itself. These things live. Though we call trees inanimate, it is really only man's structures that are so. No living germ is in his pillar, as in the heart of an oak. Only in the intangible things of the mind can man approach this creative power. And even then, it is seldom that a thought springs up in faultless symmetry into music or poetry. The grass blade rising from its sheath in unassuming perfection is more marvellous in its imminent beauty than the two-edged blade of a legendary angel sword. Where did the first shaping happen? Was the blade there when the sheath began to push through the soil? or when it lay ready to emerge in minute integrity from the root. The same curiosity is awakened by the small brown bud at the end of a chestnut twig in autumn, a little farther on than this year's fruit. How much of the future form is hidden in that small sphere? How much embryo tree is wrapped in its inner cases of wool and velvet? What hint of next summer's white chalice and green finger dwells in its innermost recesses. Long before the unfolding of these buds in April, when the downy leaflets uncurl, you can see, if you open one, the compressed cluster, each yellowish ball about the size of a pinhead, which is the future flower, and the faint dawnings of leaves all wrapped in soft wadding. The thought of the sap forming itself into these marvels, of the skilful, silent artistry going on without hands, at the end of every bough and at the heart of every root, makes the world a place of almost unbearable wonder. The absolute silence makes this more impressive after one has realized it, but sometimes it makes one forget what is happening. Man's work is accompanied by so much noise. If he desires a silver cup for sacraments, there must go into its fashioning the sound of hammering, the scratch of a chisel, the roar of a furnace. But when the innumerable chalices of the privet are made ready for the hawk moth's first taste of honey, there is no stir at all. The aisles and transepts of our temples rise with clamour of voices and commotion of labour. Even the poetic silence of Solomon's building meant tumult somewhere. But the aisle of pines down a mountain side, the transept of beeches in a valley, rise as softly as though in majestic completeness. A crocus achieves her end. Her curving cup stands up in the light and air, in spite of the weight of inanimate matter pressing on her from all sides during her upward progress. With thin petals folded close in the delicate pointed case, 
she comes through scatheless and silent. Not only does this formative power triumph over all obstacles in producing its special symmetry, but it evolves countless variations of it from one germ of life. As in the pear tree's latticework of little twigs, pillars of trunk and branch, flat oval leaves, round five-petaled flowers, pitcher-shaped calyx, pointed seeds, and fruit like a falling raindrop. Stranger than this complexity is the continuity of individual forms. What slumbers in the fourfold seed case of the beech? and is essentially different in result from the embryo in the winged Samara of an elm. The beech leaves that Virgil loved before Christianity came into the world throw the same shadows on our churches as they did on the forest altars of Pan. Every year the daisy root sends up its little rayed disc. When long ago Odoric of Pordenone left the snowy Alps for the Himalayas, snow crystals of the same form still fell round him. These complex and lovely figures, condensing upon their mysterious nucleus of cosmic dust, always keep the same intrinsic structure. Feathered stars, roses set in ferns, rayed trefoils, seaweed-like fronds full of little suns, they have all the same angles and are made hexagonally. Just as a certain air, introduced continually in a piece of music, expresses the idea of the composer, so this perpetual reincarnation of the same cabalistic signs in nature might help us, if we could gather the scattered meanings, to a clearer understanding of the plasmic force behind them a force patient and vast, vouchsafing no explanation. In this occult script, the world might find a new Bible of spiritual enlightenment, a writing not in fire upon tablets of stone, but in subtle traceries on young leaves and buds. Have not all symbolic artists, children and priests of new religions some intuition of this? For the thought, so dim and so dear, that all fine contours are a direct message from God, is rooted deep in the minds of the simple-hearted who are the magi of the world. We see, now that Christianity has interpreted it for us, the significance of the cross. That monogram of Christ and Cote d'Amur of pity built up somewhere in the branches of almost every tree, stamped in the centre of almost every flower. Humanity had learnt to make the cross long before that mild night when the flocks cried across the slopes of Bethlehem and their keepers whispered of visions. It may be that if Christ had not died, the meaning of the cross would have been revealed in some other way. The circle, with its segments, curve, crescent, semicircle, is another letter of the multitudinous alphabet. One of the loveliest variations of it is the chalice, where the centre has receded so that the flower is at once round and deep. In all cup shapes and trumpet shapes there is the fascination of this remote centre where the heart of the bloom dwells. Two of the most beautiful of these are the white convolvulus, San Grael of the hedges, and the Dwell, that lurid amphora where the death's head moth, with its weird form and wings of enchanted purples, drinks under the white light of the moon, and, if it is touched, cries out like a witch in a weak, strident voice. The world is based on curves. For each of us, morning means the growing circle of the sun. We wait in storms for the grand half-circle of the rainbow, which is far more impressive in its governed sweep, embracing the world, than in the flaming of its seven divided colours. There is nothing so restful as a perfect circle, 
whether seen as in the full moon or implied as in the young crescent it is a symbol of things men feel but cannot understand so merlin made the round table in tokening of the roundness of the world so vaughan saw eternity like a great ring nearly all essential things are round the perianth of flowers where the seed is stars the window of the eye lines after all are only for measuring circles the diameter of the earth is unimportant in itself though perspective has an extraordinary power of bringing wonder hunger for the far away fear of the future it must be a long perspective a piece of road or a tree must attain a certain length or height before it haunts the imagination but a circle however small is immutable holds infinity because of this and because of the implied centre it is the most perfect symbol of divinity all green things that have to cleave their way come into the light like swords grass leaves emerging from the sheath shoots splitting the bark all these are pointed in the outermost branches and the topmost twig of a tree the point sharply defines the limit of the individual form as it stands against the vagueness of air the point is where thought slips from the finite to the infinite like a bird balanced on the top of a fir tree before he trusts himself to immensity at the point of death has in it something of this idea of the sudden ending of a form where the topmost shoot of mortality ceases upon the eternal the circle is static the point dynamic man finds in the plastic beauty of earth revelations for his practical needs it is as if the forms of nature waited through the centuries until the moment comes for man to gather the ripe idea in them the acanthus gave its curve to greek sculpture the symmetry of many plants is akin to the spirit of ancient peoples woad with leaves like roughly made arrowheads golden saxifrage with its calyx like a roman urn meadow vetchling with its curious stipules like spearheads locked in conflict wandering once in june over some roman ruins in an english field i was struck by the strange kinship between the plants that now carpet the place and the men who once lived there perhaps some roman gathering saxifrage for medicine wondered at the perfection of the little cup and designed one like it or an armourer looking idly at the lathyrus stipules may have gained from them the idea for a new kind of spear earlier still a british boy plucking woad may have chipped an arrowhead in imitation of it in the hot silence of the broken walls the saxifrage cup was as redolent of rome as the glass urn that was found buried there the lathyrus leaves like spears and swords among the scarlet banners of the poppies recalled the glory of the cohort and legion to know the beauty of earth's lineament one must watch them through the seasons spring is the time of points and immature half rounds when everything is folded there is a gradual thickening of outline a massing of shapes a growing indefiniteness of branch and twig the intrinsic structure of winter is being veiled by the new extrinsic forms leaves cover the bare hawthorn flowers foam over the leaves then comes summer the underlying frame is obliterated when the woods are flooded with bloom the leaves are almost unnoticed when the country is a swing with music and a light with colour and the fields are full of seeded grass the curves of the flowers are softly effaced 
and rounded into the regnant fruit then autumn sends a wind in the treetops twig after twig emerges from the ramifications of foliage the little birch discards her last raiment and stands erect in essential beauty with every graceful branch delicately outlined on the sky the ash looks as fine as maidenhair with its intricate traceries interspersed with brown samaras the most ethereal forms belong to winter hers is the beauty that the leaf has when substance and sap are gone and only the frail white outline remains this is the best time to learn the proportions of things the lack of this period of stern outline must make a difference in the character of the inhabitants of lands that never know any cessation of luxuriance in a winter landscape especially in a wood there is the same kind of purity that the greeks saw in the unclad human form it is like a young athlete ready for racing with his flowing garments flung aside it is an education in restraint after seeing it one cannot forget the fine severity beneath all natural beauty there is no impressionism in a tree or a hill under the irregularities of color the splashes and brilliant gleams is the line perfection in which the impressionism of art fails an artist can transfer the acacia to canvas in a series of green and white dots and blurs but he does not achieve all the beauty for beneath the tree's arborescence is the fineness of an etching the knowledge that under the chestnut's thick curtains and the aspen's tremulous foliage is a faultless frame gives the trees an honor beyond mere surface beauty it is this austerity in even the airiest thing like a butterfly's wing that makes the study of form ennobling we do not know why the springing straightness of a bough the cup-like hollow in an apple petal the gentle curves that meet at the end of a laburnum leaf are so lovely we only feel their delight it may be because in all these shapes there is nothing extraneous nothing unfinished the flower has no unnecessary petals the birds homes are wholly complete we can gain a grasp of this wonder of structure from a seed of ground cell or the sparrow's feather picked up in the street for a spray of plummy meadow sweet or one dandelion floret is a poem in itself and the sand particle is complex curiously fashioned and polished the triangles ovals trefoils and eared circles of pollen are minutely perfect the pollen grain of chicory and outer and inner hexagon united by rays is a rose window in a shrine of lapis lazuli it needs naught behind it for it illumines itself within is no mere painting but a powerful principle an active creature the architect of next year's sky blue temple there is a striking unity in some flowers between the shape of the pollen grain and that of the calyx and corolla the open chicory flower and the pollen grain are both polygonal and rayed from the center the pollen grain of the passion flower like a round filigree box with a lid is almost exactly the same in construction as the centre of the flower with its enamelled cutwork of stamen stigma and filament apart from colour form is awe-inspiring because it seems to be the outcome of mind alone the marble whiteness and stillness of a statue and the greatest of greek tragedies these strike coldly on the heart for their creators were occupied with form and intellect to the exclusion of more emotional things a skeleton is terrifying for the same reason at the thought of the mountains in the moon and of all places of a kindred desolation upon earth we tremble 
in these majestic and gloomy formations no stir or gleam hides from us the fearful vision of what the world might have been if its economy had not included the kindly and comforting developments of life motion and colour the forms of nature seem to speak of the ageless and omnipotent life of their cause who formed the round reed in the marsh for the music of pan the rugged upland tree for the cross of christ man's ingenuity cut and notched the reed for joy and bound the wood straightly for pain but the hollow reed and the ash tree were not of his shaping any more than the wild melody of the syrinx or the magnificent silence of calvary were of human impulse End of chapter 4, part 1chapter four part two of the spring of joy by mary webb this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian beauty part two the beauty of shadow they seated themselves under the shade of this white thorn and took their solace old romance shadow is one of the easiest to perceive of all nature's beauties as one may see the charm of a profile for the first time when looking at a silhouette so one becomes aware of the perfection of a natural outline more quickly by seeing it drawn in one colour it is much simpler to trace the fairy fretwork of a mountain ash when it lies on the grass in shadow than when the eyes are dazzled by the vivid green and clustering scarlet of berry and leaf against the sky it has become a blue tree on the green canvas of a field without shadow things would seem unreal unbreathing as figures in a dream flat unrelieved tapestry on the walls of the world with it comes reality and rounded loveliness it is only the bare winter tree the barren heart that are shadowless the colors of shadow vary with climate and season they are mauve on ripe corn deeply black on hot white roads in summer purple on ploughlands in sandstone country silver gray on snow blue is their prevailing color varying from the sapphire of love in a mist to the indigo at the root of a thundercloud in motion as well as in tint these astral bodies of material things have an ever-changing individuality faithfully following or waiting beside their prototypes they fit with the birds small winged spirits and even a bee's wing so unsubstantial itself has a faint replica that follows its airy fanning the shade of a leaf caresses its own flower and its fellow leaf with gentle strokings and when a cherry blossom falls down the checkered steeps of the tree a little mournful shadow goes with her the shade of the tendrilled creeper steals into a room and lies along the floor an emissary from the plant outside that peers in but cannot enter the somnolent gloom thrown by the massed foliage gives majesty to the summer field and how splendid on some loud day in the equinox is the sight of the dumb shadows of the shouting gesticulating trees tossing and bending lengthening and shrinking over the land cloud shadows on a plain are inexpressibly alluring some are like a mere breath on a mirror others are dark and ominous passing into the distance only to be replaced by fresh phalanxes as though some conquering army had gone forth but they are most stately over mountains for they alone have power to darken the everlasting summits midday the period of practicality is fitly unshadowed perhaps that is why it is so little glamour 
but when the tired labourer returns homeward in the evening he is led or followed by a lengthening shade every tree and hedge sends forth a little mimic to join the ranks the sheep and cattle walk the field with shapes of primeval beasts behind them houses stand half circled in black moats the world is barred with gold and purple now beside the runlets on the hills the pipkins of the mimulus which have stood half full of shadow all day brim over now the sharp clear outline of the western hill steadily ascends its neighbour till all the heather has been quenched except the one line of blood red at the summit the thick curtain covers that also but it has no power over the immortal heavens then comes sleep and deepens down the world out of shadow comes the dewy morning into it retires the silent dusk out of it one by one we wander our young eyes full of mystery into it we all depart when the noonday heat is past and the labourer returns home if you will go out on some june morning before the earliest bee comes droning by when the stripes of sunlight lie right across the awakening earth you will know the fascination of shadows on such a day they are almost as blue as chicory as a child i remember standing awestruck at the strange beauty of a well-known field in the magic of a june dawn it had a line of tall trees in its eastern hedge and if you watched while the sun rose you saw what had been a wide grey expanse suddenly spanned by swart prostrate giants it was as if with one movement every tree had flung itself upon its face mohammedan wise at the muzain of sunrise perhaps the memory of such fresh delights like dew in the flower cup of life may linger even after the flower is gathered quite early on a summer morning if you look down an ugly street in a busy town you will scarcely know it the rows of houses have ceased to look dull and have become the opposing camps of light and darkness the street is a tessellated pavement of blue and yellow the bush that looks so pathetically inadequate by day throws quite a forest of obscurity and becomes mysterious the shadow of a tree upon any house blesses it weaving with its cool hypnotic gestures a soothing quiet but the place of all human habitations where it best loves to linger is a village street there each life is framed in garden and orchard companies of spirit shapes go trembling up and down the humble walls and roofs all day from the multitude of surrounding leaves in the highway the sunshine sleeps by the shadow of an ivied wall disturbed only once in an hour and then simply turning in its sleep if those other shades the troubles of life have become too dense and shouldered out the light so that the sick imagination sees them as crouching beasts of prey a pilgrimage to such a tranquil place in lilac time may help to set things right again in that sequestered road where the whir of a linnet's flight is startling before the first workman comes through the dew you can hardly fail to gather some share of peace there where the wet lilacs fling their fragrance from garden to garden like bridges and the pale images of their massed blossom and heart-shaped leaves lie all along the way questionings will seem a little unimportant the shade-strewn road preaches so sweetly the necessity of interspersed dimness and light by and by a door opens and a labourer goes whistling down the chequered track that is so like his life here even death loses some of its grimness its hideousness of association which is so unnecessary 
for the imagination sees the highway of mortal existence where it ends abruptly penumbrous flecked with shade from the heart-shaped leaves of the tree of life and the shadow is the sign that we have come at last within the pale of the tree's mysterious whisperings the slightly blurred colours of reflections water shadows are more vivid than reality as if water were a brighter medium than air what they lose in strength of outline through the motion of the current they gain in dreamy charm were ever forget-me-nots half so blue as those that gaze skyward from clear water did you know all the sweetness of flushed wild rose faces until you saw them sleeping in a stream some spell lies on rivers where willows bend over them and transfuse them with tender green with depths of swaying leaf reflections lighter in the centre where the overhanging tracery shows the sky very dark at the sides where the grassy banks are steep and the leaves thick such beauty brings the longing almost a torment to some minds to be absorbed in nature dissolved in it even to the losing of personality perhaps the person who most nearly approaches this oneness physically is a boy who plunges into a green pool in the early morning spiritually the greeks came near it with their legends of maidens melting into laurels or becoming nightingales after death beside a full flowing river in autumn this longing is strong and urgent coming round a curve you stop with a sudden intake of the breath dazzled by a blaze of glory there stands on the bank and there lies in the flood a tree of beaten gold gently moving against the sky gently quivering in the water flinging largesse of its yellow money into the vistaed gold of its reflection the sun makes each leaf transparent and the whole picture is ardent as the face of some angel of a flaming star as the spirit strives to gather some of the beauty it longs to be less finite less bounded it desires an infinite future in which to reflect universal loveliness when the sun and the wind are abroad together watch the cloud reflections hurrying along with the current of a river or travelling upstream this last is like the striving of two wills for the mastery the froth of the current and the foam of the clouds continually cross in glassy lakes the surrounding woods meet in the depths of the water and make a strange new world no wonder there are so many legends of villages and churches under meres and bells ringing eerily below the water lilies looking down into the limpid quiet where everything is so familiar yet so alien the eye sees beyond those mysterious green glades habitations of the water country twisted of chimney as an elfin chateau blurred replicas of some cottage on the bank waving in outline and impossible in perspective almost one can see the inhabitants passing at the end of the glades or a white hand waving from the window of an unsubstantial dwelling almost one can see the gleaming arm of some water maiden Igler or vivian of the lake beckoning bare and beautiful or clad in shining samite though there is no hylas now to be charmed into green silence no escalibur to be lifted above the mere yet there is still magic in these reflections on calm hot days water sends up over bank and tree vacillating shimmering patterns that waver to the treetop and back again like flocks of hovering golden birds far within clear water dwells the sun's twin brother there the pale sister of the moon goes sailing there the stars glimmer spreading into little moons shrinking into mere points of light 
at the will of the water. When we look down into the blueness of some little pool, rejoicing in the bird-like passage of the clouds, and then look up to the wide sky, we realize that the finite is like a lake, which, as far as its capacity allows, mirrors the infinite. And when we see the foreshortened image of a poplar stretched in pale colouring beneath it, we have a sudden vision of time as the faint, straightened shadow of eternity. End of chapter 4, part 2「with many glad gilden streams, and eke the welkin was so fair, blue bright, clear was the air. Chaucer A rose that flushes in the bud, grows pure white in maturity. A sycamore leaf, from the moment of its soft uncurling, changes a little day by day, until the final flame of the year so the colours of all things fluctuate continually. They seem to float round material forms, migratory, never a changeless possession of any. Nightly the darkness washes them out with her dusky brush, and in the strong hands of the seasons they are ephemeral. When the hazy freshness thickens daily round an older trunk, one can hardly believe that anything so ethereal emanates from the black bark. It is like a green gossamer from the evening west, caught in the branches. Blossoming time in damson country, when the whiteness foams over valley and ridge, has the same effect of clouds resting on the trees. To the eye of imagination, all things stand haloed in colour that flickers and quickens mysteriously. However much we may learn of chlorophyll, chromogen and colour cells, the pigments of nature that are made from earth and rain, air and sun, somewhere in the dark habitation of the roots and the airy galleries of the leaves, we do not know why the same ingredients should clothe one petal with flame and another with blue. We do not know what impulse sends up the water lily from the stagnant ooze in glistening white, and lays a mauve mantle over the wisteria that feeds upon corruption. Nor why two plants of the same genus, in the same conditions, should be so differently coloured as are the blue and yellow gentian. Colour, like fragrance, is intimately connected with light and between the different rays of the spectrum and the colour cells of plants there is a strange telepathy these processes so little explored seem in their deep secrecy and earthly spirituality more marvellous than the most radiant visions of the mystics of all colours brown is the most satisfying it is the deep, fertile tint of the earth itself. It lies hidden beneath every field and garden. It is the garment of multitudes of earth's children, from the mouse to the eagle. The men of the fields are russet-clad and russet-complexioned. Thousands of seeds, from the heavy burr to the breeze-blown thistle-fluff, are brown as the soil from which they come, to which they return, and of the same fruitful colour are the rushing streams, the pillars of the forest, and the buttresses of the hills. It is dim with antiquity, full of the magic that lurks within reality, and just as one stands in an ancient hall, gazing into the duskiness, and waiting for the coming of departed inhabitants, 
so one watches and listens in the tawny furrow lands for the tread of the myriads whose lives have gone to the making of them there is that in brown which surely speaks to all who are ever born into the world green is the fresh emblem of well-founded hopes in blue the spirit can wander but in green it can rest a picture of vivid contrasts could be painted in green alone there are a hundred shades of it in one field malachite beryl emerald and all the intermediate tints uncurling oak leaves have a dash of blue and a great deal of sienna daffodil leaves and holly are blue-green young larches are sky and gamboge there is a great deal of red in the tender young leaves of birches fir needles have a whitish line on the underside yews are black-green the laburnum is toned with grey because it is so plentifully mixed with other colours it is never crude it also has endless variation of transparency and opacity beech leaves in may are so pellucid that you can almost see through them rhododendrons are so solidly coloured that they reflect the light the best of all greens are in the tender plants of spring woods and meadows the anemone the red spotted sorrel ferns of fine texture glaucous mosses sedges even cooler to look upon than water not a place on earth need be destitute of green the desert has its cactus the sea its translucent weed however poor a man may be he can have a sprig of green by his door even if it is only a trail of ivy in a broken jar the saddest place can have its green shoot of hope the same hope that irradiates the burgeoning forest deep in men's hearts there lives this spirit of hope or religion renewed each spring over churches of the sternest creeds the ivy is not afraid to climb and when the church has crumbled with its dogma the ivy covers all with its kindly curtain and speaks of a life greater than these and an evergreen love that embraces all those hot splendours of sunrise and sunset of first and last things red and gold are the colours of all man loves wealth and blood that is poured to gain it scarlet lips and yellow hair the sacramental chalice and the wine within nature is prodigal of them and autumn is their festival with its shining pavements of harvest its sierras of flaming bracken its burning woods and smouldering hedges and trees like tongues of orange and red flame no coolness of the blue above no liquidness of silver nights can quench their fierceness until they have consumed their prey they are the colours of crises in stormy dawns they put the darkness to flight with their bright scimitars and stain the streams and possess the sky to them belongs ripeness apple and pomegranate and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to them belong the haughty beauty of tropical flowers and the terrible loveliness of fire and a blood-red blossom with a golden heart is the ancient emblem of passion mauve has a delicate artificiality something neither of earth nor heaven it is like the temperament which can express in sheer artistic pleasure heights and depths which it can never touch whether it is sultry as in lilac or cool as in ladies smocks this mingling of fierce red and saintly blue has an elfin quality hence comes the eeriness of a field of autumn crocuses at twilight when every folded flower is growing invisible 
and doubtless there is a fairy curled up in each. Children look for the little people in mauve flowers, Canterbury bells and hyacinths, and though they never find them, they know them there. Mauve enchants the mind, lures it to open its amethyst door, and behold, nothing but emptiness and eldritch moonshine. It is a Vivian crowned with nightshade and helleborine, leading with soft allurements to a country whose shores are of vanishing mist. Silver is akin to mauve. Foam and icicles, dandelion clocks in the sun, the moon and stars, white flowers under the moon, all have this pristine tint that is more a radiance than a colour that is without depth or shadow, with a fleetingness like that of dreams. It is the colour of the undersides of things. White willow and poplar leaves are lined with it. Watching them one is reminded of the moment when a friend unexpectedly turns his remoter self towards one, his white self, that is so easily transfigured. When the wind is in a plane tree, the multitudes of leaves are suddenly ruffled, so that the whole tree shines. It is like watching a crowd of people under some soul-stirring emotion. Half the charm of silver in nature is due to its remoteness. No ore of man's refining can attain the sparkle of a raindrop. We cannot distill the radiance from a white narcissus nor rob the stars of their silver fleeces. There is a perfect harmony of mauve and silver in a birch wood, a little while before the leaves come. The shining stems rise out of a faint purple mist, which deepens in the distance. Above, all the twigs are softly purple too, and, being very fine and numerous, they make another haze higher up. The straight silver rods gleam in long perspective in their setting of cloudy violet, lost in it above and below. Any face might look out from that mist, any white feet of nymph or hamadryad pass among the glimmering aisles. In the dim lilac-tinted distance it may be that Merlin still sleeps in his vaporous magic circle. Blue is the rarest colour, the one which least often imprisons itself in material things. There are few blue flowers, and most of them are small and fragile, like love in a mist and speedwell. Gentian is never so lavishly outspread as it is upon the heights, symbolically near the sky. Blue expanses, reflections in water, the cobalt of distance, are only lent to earth. If we want endless satisfying blue, we must look up to where it dwells in impalpable space, shining like solid enamel, or liquid and vague. There is the roaming place of the mystic. Through the dissolving azure of a summer day, he tries to probe. Into the impenetrable heavens of night, he launches his spirit like a coracle among the stars. Blue is a holy colour. The Sufis wore it with this significance, and it is fitly used for Madonna's robes and temple hangings, since the temple of our conscious and unconscious worship is canopied with it. Often a flash of sapphire in water, a shade of turquoise in the sky, will strike across the heart with an inexplicable pang. It is not sorrow, it is more than joy. It is at once the realization of a perfect thing, the fear that we may never see it again, and the instinct that urges us to ascend through the known beauty to the unknown, which is both the veil and the voice that summons beyond it. Though winter may wear a sad coloured garment, it is shot with bright threads of reminiscence and prophecy. Orange oak leaves, lingering seed vessels on ash and lime, 
crimson blackberry trails are recollections of past splendour the sear and broken reeds and rushes gold and russet are like the piled trophies of some fairy warfare spear and sword and bulrush banner recall the time when conquering summer led forth his legions there are dreams and dawnings of another summer also the twigs that look so lifeless have minute buds on them vivid points of colour the alders purple buds and dripping gold of catkins the red knobs on larches the sticky brown chestnut buds the green buds of the sycamore are all brilliant and warm with sleeping summer the purple osier is already set with green points from which are to emerge fluffy catkins and the sallow is preparing its gold and silver blossoms which are to be the early palm dripping with honey and humming with insects there are pale blooms of box and ivy fir cones rich as pineapples in the sun with flashes of blue tits wings about them red pine trunks shining greys of ash and beech bowl vivid green of elder trees holly robin hood of the woods flames in red and green blue-grey birds scud across the dim tufted meadows the distant woods grow auburn as the leaf buds swell and in their folds the shadows are like dwale after the turn of the year the tops of the poplars and aspens take the colour of ripe oats wildfire runs along the elms as the red buds push out in february is the bridal of the yew when one tree is covered with small wax cups the future berries and another is thick with honey-coloured flowers then at the least breeze the air is full of the gold dust of pollen in dark november comes the heyday of the mother tree she flushes into young rose tender as pink hawthorn but deeper all her sombre recesses of ancient green are transfigured by this surprise of beauty by these multitudes of japonica tinted berries at each spray's end flutter missile thrushes their spread wings lined with silver upon the dark green background this harmony of rose and pearl glows like an old illumination its unobtrusiveness deepens the charm only the undersides of the branches glimmer with colour only the underwings have a moonlit look yet it is enough since we know that the dark wings can be transfigured that the melancholy trees can sometimes stand beneath the pale sky in a rosy haze as if ethereal dew had distilled upon them the spirit of the picture is reminiscent of orcagna's assumption of the virgin in alabaster where angels hover round a berry-shaped mandorla in which mary is throned atmosphere that whimsical artist transforms the already brilliant world by clothing things in tints other than their own a wide sweep of country fascinates us not only by its innate beauty but by the airy blue of the far plain the smoking woods the hills like wet violets the haze that clings in the hearts of autumn trees that foams like a white sea round the stems in a larch copse and hangs pale lavender in the recesses of beech woods lends the trees more loveliness than their own brimming the valleys dimpling the fields it is the magic of a march morning looming over hills it adds mystery to their strength of outline near sunset soft films gather imperceptibly stealing over everything so that all colours while keeping their individuality are mixed with gold medium 
the clearest atmosphere throws a veil over actual things upon even a near horizon trees seldom look green but are etched upon the clouds in pale peacock and silver grey flaming at the sun's pleasure into bronze and copper often the most ordinary scenery puts on such colours as no painter would dare to imitate whoever cares to look may see his neighbour's barn standing in the celestial radiance of revelations or the fantastic brilliance of elfdom they can see ploughland red in the sunset as though stained with the blood of generations topaz pastures hedges of the blue of gobelin tapestry valleys sheeted in silver when the rising mist and the descending moonlight are interfused in heavy thunderous weather the earth returns to the iron age everything is sombre hard and grey until the sky grows hot for the melting and gives things the metallic look of lustre wear sometimes in snow a miracle of air and light transforms the world into a great glowing rose atmosphere has no abiding place no set rules for its coming and going when you walk upon the hills their watch it raiment fades and you cannot carry home the primrose mist of morning all the more appealing is this vagrant glamour because it only brushes the solid earth with swallow wings the best way of seeing colour unallied with material form is to watch the sky and when everything else is gone it shines on still above us once on a december evening the clouds were in three distinct layers of colour each moving independently blown by a different wind first came ebony beyond that moving more slowly a long straight cloud of geranium above that again a soft stratum of brown and through one tremendous gash in all three shone the kingfisher blue sky low in the west safe and far from the tempestuous masses stood hesperus around him ivory and crocus splashed the blue and just above the distant hills lay a line of green on a november morning when the sky was faint and clear and a lake of light widened momentarily along the horizon the moon stood high up with a star at her feet pale silver another star not so near was soon merged in the oncoming tawny flood which softly inundated every little crevice of the bare trees on the skyline then in plunged the sun swimming strongly bent on reaching her who thought herself so safe up there in the great expanses and she paled and slid away with her attendant star while he swam on with the tide of light that washed the sky winter sunrise gives the impression that all colours have been drawn from the earth and set in the treasury of the heavens there are the wild roses of summer hedges the young green leaves of spring there gold quickens reminding us that the sun has not forgotten his daffodils and the world warms her frozen breasts in the reflected glory often in the life of the mind also the sky brightens as the earth fades when the forlorn soul lies under a black frost and hears the long sigh of the snow wind when it seems that no shoot of hope can ever rise from an existence so bound and burdened reduced to almost imbecile passivity then across the eternal heavens trail the essential colours of life and the frozen spirit flushes into rose end of chapter four part three Chapter 5 of The Spring of Joy by Mary Webb. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. To whom care in prison keeps, and sickness doth suppress. In his bed he may lie, and enjoy the whole world. Sir Thomas Brown Along these channels of joy, laughter and beauty, vitality will flow into mind and body, when other channels are dry and filled with drifts. Invalids are too much shut away from the golden unrest, the busy quiet of nature. When a doctor who knows that earth is his ally says, Take him out, distract his mind. Well-meaning relatives take him to the scenes of his past activity. They never find out their mistake because he tries with fierce determination not to be a fool. He applauds with the rest when another man does what he once excelled in. But do we not all know that difficult smile of his? He is seeing not the bright day and the blue eyes of hope, but the contrast between his former and his present self. To him the whole thing is a kind of horrible medicine. He prefers his sick room. People without much imagination do not realize what pain they inflict when they persuade some girl, who will never dance again, just to come and watch. They arrange everything for her physical comfort, and then show her whose beauty is worn, whose girlish life is over, clearly and vividly what she has lost. Only a saint could bear this with equanimity. Not even a saint could benefit by it in bodily health. In nature there is a sure harbour, for things that once engrossed the mind begin to look pale and small when seen in conjunction with the immense brilliant perspectives of hill and sky. So life's values right themselves again. The clean breath of truth blows through this tameless world. Here are no enervating doctrines of the need of punishment through sickness. Here is no unwholesome atmosphere of self-pity and apology for bodily disability. It is hard, if people are young and eager for action, to be chained by physical weakness. It is grievous to be forced to lead a life of contemplation when the heart is set upon roaming, to be placed upon a philosophical hillside when you are all afire to be down in the plains amid the sweet, keen trouble of living. Yet a charm clothes all things seen from a hilltop. Nothing disturbs the quiet but such melodious sounds as the long iteration of a dove or the bleating of sheep, content hidden in melancholy. Through the still air come mysterious calls and echoes, remote as dreams, provocative to the imagination as a half-told romance. Looking into the world of nature from sick room or garden, one finds out how lovely the near things are. The one tree or field will reveal depths on depth of beauty to the long, concentrated gaze. When the sky after sunset is unclouded, except for some mauve lines in the east, like hyacinths under dew, sloping to a calm blue sea, the cripple will wait with a deeper thrill than the rest of us for the coming of the moon. When she glides along the hyacinth banks, a silver boat, slipping into the sea, leaving in her wake a trail of foam, he can pass with her through the midnight skies as she moves, rudderless, with no mast, an argosy of dreams for men, threading the riding lights of the stars, sailing straight on to her harbour in the dawn, drawn up at last upon an opal shore. The paralysed lad can send his heart with the gyre falcon on a day's journey from blue-girdled Iceland to the Scottish homes of the rock doves and back, or he can go with the current of the great river that flows, like the rivers that watered Eden, 
with millions of side channels and lesser streams but with ever undiminished velocity from the uttermost point of the april tree root to the uttermost point of the leaf flowing faster than the blood in the body and bearing on its flood the colour of the leaf the scent of the flower through any window may be seen the same gracious depths of blue air as buddha contemplated through the interstices of his tree as michelangelo saw through the windows of the sistine chapel the long gaze of a sick man may probe as far into the illimitable as they did in the vast caverns of space where sirius lights the traveller a genius and a weary invalid are equals both frail as stardust both elder brothers of the sun the reflections that will weave themselves across the beauty of earth the sanity that a deep knowledge of earth gives will help to balance judgment of the world's conflicts life in the green country makes philosophers and humanity needs young philosophers full of the intellectual fire and vigour that are lost in age none are better fitted for this than they whose powers circumscribed but unimpaired are all focused on the mind and who are honest thinkers because they live amid the integrity of nature for all who are cut off from complete spiritual intercourse with their fellows who are in the world but not quite of it life is difficult and burdensome but the loss of sight or hearing need not lessen their power of absorbing nature's messages and vitality if they have lost the sunsets or the songs these messages will be translated into scent or a wave of sensation one sense may bring dreams and echoes of another you can see green water shadows when the scent of meadowsweet is in the air and hear remembered music when a certain light is on the hills the satin touch of a peony petal recalls its pink sheen and the feel of a silken barley sheath brings the surge and murmur of the field the blind will hear the faintest notes in the music of earth will feel touches soft as a moth swing on hand and heart will live in a world of elusive fragrances from which others are excluded the deaf will see further into the rainbow than the rest of us and the feel of water on the hand air on the face moss underfoot will be their service of song sweeter even than the exquisite things we know transparencies veins in leaves and flowers in the water where it bends over a fall the cream and madder of pear buds the scent and music of rain are the rare breaths and gleams that come only to a few the blind and deaf can travel a long way by the strength of their enforced concentration on the senses left to them up the paths of light scent and music which seem to converge as they ascend until they melt altogether in mystery how far they will go and how much they will find out no one can tell but it is their benign work to show us the delicacy of creation filling the spaces between the old stable pleasures with these subtle new ones like daffodils planted between apple trees these stricken men and women from whom the world falls back as from a sanctuary where noise is muffled may be aware in the close and thrilling calm about them of diviner existences a more ethereal being then gazing with the undimmed vision of the soul towards the ultimate beauty which is the meaning of all symbols they will know the wonder that is a sacramental act of homage the men and women who most of all need peace are those who are smitten with some incurable disease their lives cannot be normal and the sense of injustice and of difference from others combined with their despair saps what little strength they have 
the seared spirit must have silence. In one of earth's tranquil haunts, a man may lay his head on her green pillow. At first, perhaps, he will see death looming like a black chasm across his days. But when he has dwelt for a time between the green and the blue, when he has looked long at the broad skies and considered the punctual return of life after death in spring, it may be that he will come to the consciousness of mystery brooding over the world. And because intuition tells him that death will take him a step nearer to this mystery, he will cease to think of it as a chasm and regard it rather as a gate on the skyline. Just as one stands at the foot of a steep field and sees in the hedge at the top a gate that opens on the blue, so he will see his short life as an upward slope, steep but leading to a white gate swinging upon the infinite. He will have a heritage of joy while he climbs the ascent. Sweet things about him, the warm comfort of some little creature's body pressed against face or heart the pleasure of a bird's bright eyes looking into his, its fugitive wings pausing in their flight for him. He will know the wonder of a wild creature's confidence when, instead of eluding him, it seeks his friendship. A thing as strange and joyous as if a star came sweeping from her station to light up his brow. The hearts of these dumb beings are sealed to us, their lives are wrapped in shadow. Might not the sick, by their genius for sympathy, help to bring the day when we shall cease to make ourselves ridiculous in the theatre of the cosmos by thinking that our neighbours, the people of the fields, were made for our sole benefit, and when corpses of the defenceless will be seen no more upon the tables of those who profess the gospel of love? One who has lived under the large arbitrament of earth ceases to question. There is a hand on the hot forehead. He meets death with the absence of morbidity, almost amounting to indifference, which you find in the gay, short-lived citizens of wood and meadow. Death is no longer either the supreme disaster or the supreme desire, but an incident the swinging back of the gate on the skyline. He begins to link himself with the beauty that lies in and beyond the beauty of earth, like light in a flower. An intuition begins to dawn in him that this beauty, or love, is not only above all things, but in them, permeating them. That he, and the very germ of disease that destroys his body, abide in it as inevitably as the world abides in the invisible air. When each breath is drawn in this eternal atmosphere, now and forever are one. Today, and in a million years, here and beyond the uttermost star, we are in the heart of God. In whatever way and to whatever extent people are set aside from the world, they can make their lives magnificent, bringing an evangel of peace to the travel-worn companies of men. They dwell in the land of consolation, beside the healing watercourses, lily-bordered, poplar-circled, flowing purely from the divine sea. In this land no visible country, they are caught away into holiness by the vision that they see when a leaf unfolds, or when the birds make low, moonshiny music in the dusk. To them life comes pulsing down the sunbeam, whitening in the clover, fleeting in the wind. If invigorated by this vitality, cured of soul sickness or body sickness, they take up their work again, they may still live as the plant lives, whose everyday doings are a lyric. Walking among men with the light of their abiding joy in their eyes, they can beautify the workaday world. They can gather up nature's ancient memories, her twining prophecies, and bind them about men's work and faith, 
linking ordinary and common things with the miraculous and remote they can be like flames passing through filthy places scorching cleansing growing in light by feeding on darkness when a man ceases to find in the natural world material aims only when watching a flower he can almost see the artist's hand lift from the penciling of its transparent veins then he will have attained such strong freedom that he will stand already on the foothills of eternity gazing with love and wonder into the complex life of nature which is the life of god once on a clear winter day a wide stretch of ploughland lay before me it was beautiful in the rich colouring and fertility of its shallow faintly shadowed furrows but it was still and silent as nature seems to those who see nothing within and beyond it suddenly i was aware of swift continual motion all over the brown land up and down the furrows gleamed the white breasts of plovers in a moment they rose with a flashing of underwings in the light and their plaintive cry came down through the thin air united to the soil by all the ties of life being its very essence they were yet much more they were the soul of the field gifted with music and motion and the freedom of the sky so at first the patient watcher of earth sees only inanimate beauty voiceless without initiative then suddenly there is a clapping of wings a flash of immortal radiance a strange haunting cry and he has had a vision of the soul of the world end of chapter five and end of the spring of joy a little book of healing by mary webb